Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brown Bag Lunch here at the Sandusky Library. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm the Museum Services Manager for the Sandusky Library and Followed House Museum. And we have another wonderful day, uh, another wonderful program dreamed up here. Uh, just before I introduce or let our speaker introduce herself today, um, I do want to say we do have another Brown Bag program uh, next month. Uh, that is going to be on the book Peoples of the Inland Sea by uh, David, uh, Dr. David Nichols. Um, so that, that'll be our program for next month, and we hope you'll be able to join us again, and that program will be once again online. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to turn this program over to our guest speaker for the day. Uh, this is Dr. Jamie Goodall, and I'll let her introduce herself, and then we'll go right into the program. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I just want to preface this by saying apologies in advance if you hear my dogs. Um, and also, if you hear any buzzing, my mom took a quite nasty fall down the stairs yesterday. And so my brothers have been texting me all day, just checking in on her. Um, I am a staff historian with the US Army Center of Military History. And previously, I was an assistant professor of history at Stevenson University. My doctoral specialization is in Pirates of the Caribbean um, and the broader Atlantic world. And I focus in on Atlantic world military and early American histories. So when Jeremy asked if I wanted to give a presentation on Pirates of the Great Lakes, I thought that this was a really great opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, for me to branch out. Um, and so we'll go ahead and dive into the presentation. Um, as far as some background, when we think about pirates, we tend to envision the swashbucklers who marauded their way through the Caribbean, like Blackbeard, uh, or those who disrupted commerce in the Indian Ocean, like Henry Avery. And we tend to think of the pirates of the Golden Age of Piracy, which lasted roughly from 1650 to 1730. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, of course, the Caribbean was a really important region for trade. But there's another region that played host to these very unsavory characters, whether that was as pirates or as privateers, and that's the Great Lakes. Uh, today, we'll talk not only about piracy that occurred within the Great Lakes, but also about the pirates who called the Great Lakes home. Um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with the geography, I just want to give a little bit uh, of context here. So the lakes, of course, are like inland seas. Uh, so having pirates on them is not necessarily as shocking as we might think. Uh, they're vast and they include the lakes Michigan, Superior, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. Now Lake Michigan, of course, is the largest and deepest of the Great Lakes, bounded by Michigan and Wisconsin to the south and Minnesota and Ontario to the north. Uh, lake Huron is the second largest, home to more than 1,400 shipwrecks. The third largest lake, Lake Michigan, is bounded by, um, or it, the third largest lake is bounded from east to west by Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, and it is the only Great Lake entirely within U.S. borders. More than 2,500 shipwrecks are documented here, which is more than any other Great Lake. Uh, lake Erie, the fourth largest, is host to more than 1,900 shipwrecks. And lastly, the smallest, Lake Ontario, is the easternmost of the Great Lakes and holds more than 1,200 shipwrecks. So these lakes really proved to be quite violent, especially in the fall. Um, so home to countless shipwrecks from Le Griffin to the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, now, unlike the Caribbean, where gold and silver were the ideal treasure, pirates and the privateers in the Great Lakes region prized things like timber, women, fish, supplies, and even whiskey above all else. And so important were the lakes that Americans, British, and indigenous peoples, and even Confederates fought for control over these wonders. And what about piracy versus privateering? I wanna give a little context uh, to that as well. And technically there's only two things separating a pirate and a privateer, and that was perspective and a letter of mark. Now in times of conflict, government officials would permit people to arm their personal vessels and attack enemy ships in order to disrupt trade. Uh, by disrupting trade, they hoped that they would weaken the war effort. Both pirates and privateers had one main job, and that was to attack and plunder ships. And in essence, a letter of mark really just gave privateering the, uh, or gave the act of piracy a facade of legitimacy. So 
while privateering was viewed as sort of an honorable and patriotic duty uh, by augmenting naval forces, piracy was widely considered a scourge on the seas, or in our case, the lakes. But in reality, the lines between these two were not sharply defined, and privateers often strayed from their intended path. Privateers were really just little more than legally sanctioned pirates whose actions were clearly piratical under the rule of law, but which purposefully went unpunished. Now, in order to have a letter of mark, the name of the enemy nation or nations that you were going to attack had to be clearly stated, and all prizes were to be brought before an admiralty court or before a court of the United States when we uh, get to the War of 1812 to determine its status. Uh, there were supposed to be pretty heavy penalties if a privateer seized the ship of a neutral nation, um, but privateers really felt that it was better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Once their uh, capture was deemed a legitimate prize, neutral nations, of course, would make complaints to the offending governments for their losses. And sometimes these offended nations would try these so-called privateers as pirates by refusing to recognize the letter of mark is legitimate. And oftentimes they would execute the alleged privateer uh, before anything could be done about it. The Reverend Cotton Mather once lamented that privateering easily degenerates into the piratical and proves an inlet unto so much debauchery and iniquity and confusion that he hoped all good Christian men would support him in its opposition. Uh, so why would a privateer risk attacking a neutral ship? Uh, the first and most obvious reason is greed. The captain and crew of a privateering vessel were not paid a salary, so it's very similar to piracy in that regard. And the owner of the vessel would only make a return on his investment if the venture was successful. So really any money the privateers or the owners of the ship would receive came from the sale of a captured ship and its cargo. Part of the profits went to the privateers, part to the vessel's owner, and part to the government in question. So if a privateer wanted to get paid and there were no enemy ships around, they might settle for a neutral one. The second is that news of a peace agreement might between nations might not reach them in time. So they might seize a vessel believing it to still be an enemy prize. Uh, this of course happens uh, in the War of 1812. Uh, we see this play out with the army, for example, when Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans occurs two full weeks after peace had been reached. A third possibility is the fact that between the 17th and 18th centuries, European nations found themselves entangled in no fewer than a dozen conflicts. So allegiances during and between these conflicts frequently shifted. So the attack on a vessel might merely be out of confusion. Was it friend or was it foe? And what about neutral goods being carried by belligerent vessels? So the blurred line between piracy and privateering continued to be a problem and to really cause confusion and economic losses well into the 19th century. Uh, so with that context, uh, I want to go ahead and dive in. I've broken this down into three major sections. Uh, we have pirates of the pre-1800 era. We have the pirates and privateers of the War of 1812. And then we have those pirates and privateers at the turn of the 20th century. So pre-1800 really is the height of piracy. And one of the first pirates uh, to engage on the Great Lakes was a man named Calico Jack Rackham, who was active around the mid-1700s. Rackham was born in England around 1682, and although he's most famous uh, for his Atlantic world exploits, particularly off the coast of Jamaica with the nefarious Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, some have tied him to the Great Lakes. Uh, unfortunately, records are pretty hard to come by, but it's alleged that he would steal anything from cash boxes to entire ships on the lakes. They say that Calico Jack would wait until a fisherman or a woodcutter was away from their ship and then sail off with it in the night. So he would avoid attacking uh, head on uh, to minimize his losses and just try to steal uh, what was easily available. Rackham was pretty notorious for his stealthy crimes, and it's believed that his successes in the Atlantic were a direct result of the practice he gained uh, by his piracy on the Great Lakes before he ventured to the Caribbean. Uh, 
So he's one of the more famous, uh, even though he might not have operated in the Great Lakes for very long, but he's the interesting character if you have a chance to look more into him. Another uh, pirate or privateer, depending on your perspective, was a man named George Colby. Uh, he operated during the French and Indian War. Colby and the Colby pirates, as they were known, were technically British privateers. Unlike the pirates of the Spanish and Caribbean seas, the Colby pirates operated largely without large and fast ships. Uh, they would use these small vessels to their advantage. They often used mock lighthouses or fires to cause unsuspecting French merchant ships to run aground, which made them very easy prey. Once a ship was stranded, the Colby pirates would use their small vessels to plunder the cargo of the helpless French ships, which ultimately helped the British defeat the French, particularly in the region of the Great Lakes. After the signing of the Treaty of Paris, King George III officially disbanded the Colby pirates, revoking their status as privateers as their service to the crown was no longer needed. But uh, some records say that the Colby pirates continued to attack merchant shipping on the Great Lakes even after their uh, stint as privateers had ended. So they were active between about 1701 to 1763, and some argue well into the 1770s. So again, uh, that fine line between piracy and privateering being crossed. And then the third uh, most famous pirate of the Great Lakes during the height of piracy was Juan Eduardo de Rivera. And what's interesting about Rivera is that we don't have concrete evidence that he actually existed, but it hasn't stopped his legend from spreading. And he was allegedly active from about 1793 to 1809. Uh, so Juan Eduardo de Rivera operated from the deck of a schooner called the Diamante Negro. And he and his men worked pretty much as commerce raiders and they would roam and plunder the small fishing villages and trading settlements that dotted the shoreline of Lake Huron. They were also known to wreak havoc on Lake Erie in Michigan, uh, taking whatever they wanted from whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Um, De Rivera got his start, however, in the Gulf of Mexico before he moved north in 1793. On the Great Lakes, Rivera could truly be a swashbuckling buccaneer and go virtually unchallenged, which was not the case in the Gulf of Mexico. According to legend, De Rivera was tall for a seaman, standing approximately six foot four, so you can imagine he was quite intimidating. He allegedly went to sea at the tender young age of 13 as a cabin boy aboard the ship of an infamous Cuban raider. And it was on this ship that he learned the tactics of invading, pillaging, and escaping before the cover of night could give way to the first light of morning. It was really the perfect training for De Rivera's arrival on the Great Lakes. Although a few ships sailing from Chicago to Buffalo carried gold-laden prospectors returning from the West, most of the ships sailing the Great Lakes carried no treasure, as I mentioned. So De Rivera targeted the settlements and towns along the shores and up the rivers uh, as a means of trying to get at some of that gold. De Rivera ran pretty freely all over the Great Lakes, uh, his pockets becoming even more swollen with bounty as time went on. And it's said that De Rivera became increasingly proficient and confident in his ability, which probably led to his demise. It was in June of 1799 that De Rivera executed his most famous raid. It was a pirate invasion like no other ever attempted on the Great Lakes and really rivaled some of the uh, raids on land in the Caribbean as well. De Rivera's target was Cleveland, which lay on the south shore of Lake Erie. At the time, it was a bustling hub of the fur trade. So De Rivera decided on a bold, untested attack, and this time he decided to attack during broad daylight as opposed to using the cover of nightfall. He chose a Saturday morning, thinking that the city would be, you know, drowsy at best or still, or drowsy at worst or still asleep at best. And he proved to be right. De Rivera easily emptied the banks hauled some wagon loads of whiskey to the lakefront and raided some homes of Cleveland's wealthiest residents. Then the Diamante Negro set sail for a hideout along the wilderness northern shore of Lake Erie. 
Some claim his end came on the Detroit River in 1809. According to legend, there, de Rivera rose at dawn to find his ship surrounded by four gunboats, allowing no escape route. The crew eventually surrendered, all except de Rivera, that is. Uh, it's said that de Rivera, standing on the bow of his ship, declared he wouldn't be taken alive and flaunted his last act of defiance by lashing his feet to a Diamante Negro anchor and cutting it loose. Uh, doing so, legends say that he disappeared into the water and was never seen again. According to the crew of the Diamante Negro, however, they argue that de Rivera may have cut himself loose from that anchor and reached the shore unnoticed, uh, and that he potentially went back to the Gulf of Mexico in order to continue his pillaging ways. So whether he's real or not, his legend is that he was probably the most prolific pirate of the Great Lakes, at least until Dan Seavey at the turn of the 20th century. And so that's sort of the height of piracy. Uh, so we'll move into the War of 1812, where privateers were operating in uh, support of the American cause against the British particularly. So after de Rivera's alleged reign of terror, piracy seemed to really decrease in the Great Lakes region until the War of 1812, when countless British and American men answered the call to be privateers. Uh, their job, of course, was to disrupt commerce and evade blockades. And one of the only uh, recorded privateers that we have is a man named William Johnson. Well, not much is known about Johnson. We do know that he absolutely detested the British and he decided to support the Americans against the British. He moved to the US side of Lake Ontario and was paid along with a band of assistants to take British property. After capturing a small fleet of British boats, uh, Johnson discovered a letter from one British official to another with some information that was incredibly helpful to the Americans' war efforts. And because of this, the Americans continued to allow him to operate on the Great Lakes in the hopes that he would bring even more information to them. Um, and again, we don't have much record of what happened to Johnson at the close of the war, uh, but suffice to say his actions on the Great Lakes were incredibly important to the American cause. Uh, and like I said, we don't really have much evidence for other privateers, although we know they operated during the War of 1812, but this is just one gentleman that I wanted to introduce you to. So after the war, piracy once again was barely a blip on the radar until about the mid-1800s. Uh, so between 1850 and 1920, we have a couple of different individuals operating. Uh, the first is a man named Jesse Jane, or James Jesse Strang, active between about 1844 and 1856. He is the self-proclaimed king of Beaver Island and the Mormon Marauders. Uh, while Strang was never officially labeled as a pirate, his actions were very clearly piratical in nature. And he's a very interesting character. After the death of Joseph Smith Jr. of the Mormon Church, Strang claimed he was the successor of the religious sect. Despite having an allegedly forged letter proclaiming his right as successor, most Mormons actually followed Brigham Young. But those that chose to follow Strang became his commerce raiders, who would frequently invade isolated coastal settlements and lighthouses. At one point, his marauders burned sawmills and stole $1,600 worth of goods from a local store. An article in the New York Times read that, quote, the people along Lake Michigan from here north to the Manistee have been thrown into the most intense excitement by the operations of a gang of marauders who are reported to be Mormons from Beaver Island and who have carried on their operations with a boldness coolness and desperation rarely equaled in the records of highwaymen. Of course, the United States government treated Strang's actions as treason, but Strang's popularity continued to grow. He became the only technically crowned monarch in American history, even if that was self-proclaimed. Strang seemed to take a tip from George Colby's playbook by faking, by building fake lighthouses to cause ships passing by Beaver Island to run aground. Allegedly, the Mormon marauders would then enter the ship, murdering the men on board and taking the women that were aboard to the island to live under Strang's rule. 
But unfortunately for String, his downfall would be pretty swift and brutal. After he ordered the whippings of several subjects for not, uh, not complying with his decrees, two of his subjects found revenge. On June 16, 1856, Thomas Bedford and Alexander Wentworth, who were among those who had been whipped, ambushed Strang, shooting him and beating him several times. The men, ironically, were granted protection from the United States, even though Strang ultimately died of his wounds. Strang was allegedly buried in Voree, Wisconsin, and although he wasn't technically labeled a pirate, uh, his actions may have ignited the pirate king trope, this idea of one ruler who oversaw a series uh, or a crew of multiple pirates. So again, very interesting aspect, uh, particularly the religious aspect of Strang's marauding. Next, we have uh, another leader of marauders named Captain Bully Hayes, and he was active around the mid-1850s to 1876. Born in the late 1820s in Cleveland, Ohio, at the age of 20, he decided to become a ship captain and sail the Great Lakes. Uh, he had a reputation for being a handsome, if not violent man, and he was well known as a gambler who got into fights pretty much everywhere that he traveled. Uh, he didn't set out to be a pirate, but as he sailed the Great Lakes, accusations of piracy emerged, and he really used the Great Lakes as a training ground for what would become his later Pacific piratical exploits. He chose the Pacific for its vast opportunities, traveling to the Hawaiian Islands and all the way to Australia and New Zealand. Hayes' operations were that he would kidnap natives and sell them into slavery. He also worked closely with Chinese pirates, Shanghaiing men, or kidnapping them essentially, and selling them to the Chinese pirates. But Hayes sailed his last adventure in October of 1876 when he headed for the Marshall Islands. And there are several versions of his death. Uh, some say he was murdered by a disaffected sailor on his ship. Others claim he was killed by a maligned cook. But all versions agree that he was either killed by a blow to his head or he was shot, and that his body was pushed overboard to lie in a watery grave. Um, so for someone who was well known for his violence, he came to a pretty violent end. Um, and again, his experiences on the Great Lakes were really formative uh, for his uh, role as a pirate. Then we have a man named Jacob Thompson. Um, while Hayes was off on his Pacific exploits, the American Civil War erupted in 1861, uh, which once again gave out of work watermen and former pirates an opportunity to serve as privateers. And one such leader was uh, of the privateers was a man named Jacob Thompson, uh, active between 1861 and 1864, and who was ultimately one of the most influential figures of the war. Now, while Thompson himself was not a privateer, he oversaw some of the most important privateering missions of the war. Thompson was born on May 15, 1810 in Leesburg, North Carolina, and as an adult, he was active in the affairs of indigenous peoples and the U.S. Land Office before becoming state legislator, a state legislator and later a U.S. representative in the House. He was appointed Secretary of the Interior in 1857 when James Buchanan took office, and it was during his tenure as Secretary that he witnessed the seeds of secession being sown. On January 8, 1861, Thompson resigned as Secretary and volunteered his services to the newly formed Confederate States of America, and he even supplied some of his own personal funds in order to help equip Confederate troops. He became an aide to General Beauregard and obtained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. In late 1863, he returned to Mississippi and was again elected to the state legislature. In March of 1864, Confederate President Davis asked Thompson to lead a delegation to Canada. One part of his charge was to arrange an escape of Confederate POWs on Johnson's Island, which is off the coast of Ohio and on Lake Erie. This Union prison held approximately 3,000 Confederate POWs and the plot or the plan was to rescue the captured Confederates relying on the wits and skill of Johnson's chosen privateer, John Yates Beale. 
Beale's mission via Thompson's orders was to take the USS Michigan, which was guarding the prisoners and carry the Confederates off the island back to the Confederate borders. Posing as passengers, Beale and his men easily seized a ship called the Philo Parsons. They made a pit stop to steal timber off of Middle Bass Island and then sent a small steamer named the Island Queen to the bottom of Lake Erie. So they were pretty busy on their way to Johnson's Island. Meanwhile, Thompson ordered Captain Charles H. Cole to create a distraction and signal for Captain Beale to attack. So essentially, these two would work in concerted effort in order to attack Johnson's Island. But Cole and his men were quickly arrested and they were unable to signal Beale. Ultimately, without the signal, Beale's men mutinied as they attacked the USS Michigan, which forced uh, Beale to flee. Beale abandoned ship. But despite this disaster, Thompson and a colleague, Dr. John Bates, purchased a new boat called the Georgian for $17,000, which they intended to use as a new privateering vessel. But the ship, unfortunately, would never carry supplies or armaments nor conduct raids, and the entirety of the Johnson's Island uh, plot fell through. On April 6, 1865, the Georgian was seized by the Canadian government upon which the Canadians found documents revealing the intent to use Greek fire and Confederate Marines to attack and control Union fishing vessels in order to produce a small but fully operational Confederate Navy on the Great Lakes. So Thompson was still thinking very big when it came to his actions on the Great Lakes. But after this additional failure, Thompson sold the ship, which sank in May of 1888 and is believed to be the only pirate ship uh, technically, lying at the bottom of the Great Lakes. So, again, he was not a privateer himself, but he oversaw some very important privateering missions on the Great Lakes. And perhaps the most well-known pirate of the Great Lakes is Roaring Dan Seavey, active between about 1900 and 1918. He is also believed to be the only person charged for piracy on the Great Lakes. So even though we've had all these actors uh, as pirates and privateers, none of them were charged for their crimes in the courts. C.B. was born on March 23rd, 1865 in Portland, Maine. And while serving in the Navy, C.B. decided he'd rather give the orders than follow them. But after leaving the military, he found himself pretty much a poor man with only his ship, the Wanderer, to his name. So he decided to take up a life of plundering. What better way to make money? He was tall and stocky, well known for his commerce in illegal liquors, uh, at least starting out. And then there was the his legendary theft of a ship called the Nellie Johnson in 1908, in which he convinced the crew of the Nellie Johnson to drink with him while he stayed mostly sober himself. He then threw the drunken sailors off their ship and sailed it to Chicago, where he sold the cargo. C.B. used his ship, the Wanderer, to smuggle poach, bootleg alcohol, and run a floating brothel. One of his methods of attack was to lure loggers onto his floating brothel. Then, while they were obviously preoccupied, C.B. and his men would sail the ship out into the middle of Lake Michigan. When the loggers eventually returned to deck, C.B. and his crew would, row, uh, would take them and throw them overboard, believing the old adage that dead men tell no tales. So they really wanted no witnesses to their actions. Eventually, C.B. was arrested and tried for mutiny and sedition, uh, but the grand jury failed to indict him. He was then arrested and charged with piracy, but again, a grand jury failed to indict him. In 1918, C.B. lost his ship, the Wanderer, to fire and replaced the ship with a 45-foot motor launch. Rather than try to capture C.V. again, the authorities actually decided to make C.V. an honorary U.S. Marshal, during which time he routinely hauled in some of the most nefarious smugglers of the Great Lakes. But unfortunately for C.V., temptation was too great, and he once again returned to a life of piracy and smuggling. C.V. retired sometime in the late 1920s and settled down in the town of Peshtigo, Wisconsin. And he lived quite a long life, dying in a Peshtigo nursing home on February 14th, 1949, at the age of 84. So he is probably the best well-known of all of the Great Lakes pirates. Uh, and 
he's probably one of the more interesting just because he operated in what we would consider more modern times, uh, well after we think of piracy having ended in throughout uh, the modern world. So, um, and of course there are legends about CV and what he did after he retired from piracy. Uh, some say that he would regale his grandchildren with grand stories of his uh, Great Lakes exploits. Um, others say he would never talk about his exploits on the Great Lakes, but uh, ultimately he's a very interesting character. And so uh, I think that takes us to about 30 minutes. Um, I just want to sort of conclude there with the stories and open it up for questions just so we have plenty of time for questions. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself to ask them, or you, if you don't want to talk, you can put them in the, in the chat box um, as well. So it's kind of interesting that the, I thought it was interesting. He had that one pirate that there is no like real official record of him, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So, um, one Eduardo de Rivera, what's really interesting about him too, is that some legends say he got his start with the, uh, infamous Jose Gaspar known in Tampa Bay, uh, and the Gasparilla festival that they hold for him. Um, but much like Rivera, de Rivera, there's no evidence that Gasparilla or Jose Gaspar actually existed. So the fact that these two legends exist in concert with each other is very interesting. And both of them allegedly had their crews surrender, and both of them allegedly tied themselves to the anchor and escaped. So uh, how much of that is maybe they're the same person and they've just two different areas picked up the legend or... Maybe they really were two different individuals who worked together. It's just um, a very interesting story. Um, I guess another question I had, because I was kind of, so you talked about, and his name's uh, escaping me at the moment, but the, the pirate who was uh, kidnapping people and selling them into slavery. Uh, where was he act? So where was he actually selling them into slavery? Because almost uh, by that point in time, almost every state that bordered the Great Lakes was there was no legal slavery in them. Right. So he would operate primarily by taking them further south uh, or selling them to somebody who would transport them further south, either to a state that allowed slavery or. Uh, they would be taken to a ship that was headed to the Caribbean where slavery was still legal. And I'm happy to take questions via email if you come up with some later or you're not comfortable asking right now. Of course, the, for us here at Sandusky, the, the most important story, of course, is the one about Johnson's Island, because uh, that's right Red's in Sandusky Bay, that's very close to us. So for us, that's the most important kind of local history piracy story, piracy story that there is. Mm -hmm. And the uh complete failure of of the uh the men who were supposed to coordinate the attack with. They they arrested the first guy who showed up and he flipped right away. And yeah. they were able to scoop up everybody. So that was well, uh, I guess if we don't have any questions, um, thank you uh, once again, uh, Dr. Goodall, for joining us to do this. Uh, we have um, a copy of Dr. Goodall's book in our collection here at the Sandusky Library. So if you'd like to come and uh, read her book, we'd be, uh, I've, I've made sure we got a copy because I wanted to read it. So it's been, and I know a few other people have checked it out as well throughout the system. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, you can check out her book and uh thank you all for joining us and once again uh thank you dr goodall for coming and giving us a little bit more history about pirates on the great lakes thank you guys for being here and thanks for having me jeremy <laughs>